Dear Earthmates, uh, now uh, in this episode uh, of uh, the Earth Civilization or Civilization uh, Dialogues, we are in uh, Islamabad, uh, Pakistan with Tahira Abdullah, uh, who is a human rights defender, a social science researcher focusing on poverty issues, especially. And uh, um, yeah, and uh, dear Tahira Abdullah, um, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. And uh, what would you like to mention uh, uh, about your concerns, your uh, research areas? Uh, greetings to you and to all your uh, audience who are viewing you or, or reading this uh, transcript of this. Greetings to everyone. From uh, autumn or fall in Islamabad, Pakistan, the weather is changing and let us hope that things will change for the better. Although to be honest, uh, in my neighborhood, in my geographic neighborhood, things are not great at the moment uh, and have not been great. So one particular source of concern is uh, my Afghan sisters and brothers and children who are currently in a lot of difficulties ever since the 15th of August. In fact, if I'm honest, since December 1979, and my heart bleeds for all my sisters and brothers in Afghanistan. Similarly, all those who are undergoing terrorist attacks, all those who are undergoing sectarian violence, all those who are undergoing gender violence, gender-based violence, all those who are undergoing violence because of their um, identity politics or, or identity orientation. And most of all, out of the estimated 230 million population of Pakistan, we are planning to do a census next year. So it is an estimated population. Um, there is a lot of contradiction and conflicting views on the level of poverty in Pakistan. So officially it stands one third of the population or less than one third. Unofficially, both within Pakistan, very res highly respected, renowned economists in Pakistan, as well as abroad, for example, the Oxford Poverty Research Institute and United Nations and the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank and many other highly respected organizations, both in the non-government sector, as well as in the for-profit research sector, as well as in the international finance institution sector, are more or less agreed that poverty in Pakistan stands somewhere between 50 to 60% of the population and perhaps even more. And food insecurity stands between 55 to 60% of the population and perhaps more. Why am I saying perhaps more? Because ever since the beginning of 2020, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. The whole world is in the pandemic and Pakistan is no exception. I know that the World Bank tends to take the government's data and statistics at face value and has uh, praised the government's handling of the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. But those of us who have two eyes to see with and do a lot of field work and visits and research and have seen hospitals overflowing and have seen doctors sleeping, standing up after 48 hours of duty, nonstop. Have seen doctors dying, have seen nurses dying, have seen paramedical staff dying, having contracted COVID-19 due to lack of SOPs, lack of equipment, um, lack of masks and gloves and, and uh, gowns and, and, and proper, you know, the entire 
body body armor that that doctors and 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 health service personnel should be wearing should be provided by the government and then the vaccination period in pakistan started long after it had started elsewhere and the only reason it started and i'm not letting out any state secrets here this is public knowledge that i'm sharing with with you and your audience is because china was generous enough to gift pakistan free of cost gratis pro bono hundreds of thousands of of doses of vaccines sinopharm and other chinese vaccines i myself have received sinopharm vaccine and all this has been a free gift to the government of pakistan by the government of china because the government of pakistan despite having received billions with a b b for bat billions of dollars in emergency assistance from international organizations to deal with the coronavirus covid-19 pandemic and in pakistan it's the epidemic yet we have no accounting we have no accountability for where those billions of dollars some say 5 billion dollars some say 8 billion dollars some say 10 billion dollars where did this money come from it was siphoned away it was diverted away from economic development uh, loans and grants to pakistan which were either in the pipeline or already here but it, they were earmarked for for covid-19 funds and unfortunately the people of pakistan neither know nor are privy to the information and are not going to be shared this information as to what happened to this money for covid-19 why are we not ordering when the rest of the world started ordering vaccines from all the manufacturing companies around the world i am not going to make value judgments as to whether pfizer is better moderna is better johnson and johnson is better sputnik uh, russian sputnik is better or chinese sinopharm or or uh, uh, you know all the rest of the other vaccines that around the world are better i will not make that judgment but i am as a citizen as a tax paying citizen i am entitled to make the judgment as to why the uh, state and the government that is representing the state did not order advance order vaccines and pay for them with the money that we have in the kitty especially earmarked for covid-19 we want to know where that money has gone why are we dependent like beggars and a begging bowl on china's goodwill and generosity today we are in good relations with china tomorrow we may not be then who will bring us the vaccines we need to be able to stand on our own feet as a self respecting sovereign state and the least that the state can do is to order millions and millions of doses right now we have only 10 plus percent just over 10 percent of the population has received any dose leave alone two doses leave alone booster doses there are other countries which are poorer than us in terms of 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 uh, per capita income and gdp and gnp but they have done better than us in covid and what does that show it does not show how poor you are or how wealthy you are as a nation it shows a caring state it shows a humane state it shows an empathetic state or the lack thereof and this is what we are seeing in pakistan i see well thank you for the uh, this uh, realistic picture uh, um uh, i'm speechless and um Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I did not intend to start off so well, negative. When, I, when it came this to is, the, especially the ten percent thing, uh, yeah. it struck me. By the way, uh, 
another uh, uh, issue. Um, uh, yesterday, I saw the title of a book called Femocracy, uh, instead of democracy, femocracy, feminine uh, democracy, that is uh, where women are uh, liberated uh, when wh where women have more at least equal share in uh, saying and acting uh, what is it like to be a woman in generally uh, let's say in southwest uh, asia or what that geographical uh, uh, part of our world <clears throat> would you kindly Safe, Out think. of 199 states that are members of the United Nations, Pakistan is doing very badly on human development. And human development includes the status of women, status of children, the status of minorities, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, sectarian minorities, gender minorities, um, uh, non-binary uh, gender minorities. Um, we are not doing well at all. We are in the 150s range of 199, which means we are towards the bottom. In terms of gender, the gender global gender gap, uh, in terms of uh, women's empowerment, in terms of women's development, we are the third last in the whole world. And you, the, your next question will be, which are the two countries which are below Pakistan? And they are Afghanistan and Yemen. Yemen, which is another country at war and conflict. And for some time, Syria was below us because that is another country at war. But Syria has now gone above us. So we are even below Syria. Which, is, which has been at war for decades and is a country, you know, a devastated, destroyed infrastructure, social infrastructure, concrete infrastructure, everything. So what message is Pakistan sending out to the whole world where minorities' lives are not safe, Sector, sectarian minorities' lives are not safe, women's lives are not safe, children's lives are not safe. Uh, I don't know what kind of a message we want to send out that we are a nuclear power. And so we are, we are a powerful nation and we must have a, a permanent seat on the Security Council along with India, which also wants a permanent seat on the Security Council, but its poverty its status is also very poor. Its status of women and violence against women is also very poor. So I, take exception and I object to both Pakistan and India fighting each other and standing, spending so much on military expenditures. If there was peace between the two countries, we would need to reduce our standing armies. We would reduce our expenditure on armaments and weapons. We would do away with nuclear weapons. I want to see South Asia and the Indian Ocean as a nuclear free zone, which means India and Pakistan and all other nuclear countries which have their nuclear weapons stationed on sea carriers in the Indian Ocean. So I'm also talking about Russia and United States and UK and France and, and China and, and all the other countries which, which, which have declared or undeclared. Israel is, is an undeclared nuclear state. South Africa is an undeclared nuclear state. We don't know where Australia is in terms of, of, its, of its weaponry and its armament. Uh, we don't know where North Korea is at the moment. That is an opaque country. We really need to know more. Uh, CIPRI in Sweden tries to to, to, you know, Jane's Defense Weekly tries to keep track of what is happening in terms of armaments and weapons and, and military expenditures. Pakistan is very high. Look at our state. Why do we want to compare ourselves to Russia and USA and UK and France 
and, 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 and China in terms of military expenditures, or India even. Look at our level of human development. Look at our, at our level of inequality, income inequality, status inequality, injustice. What is the level of justice in Pakistan? How many people have access to justice in Pakistan? Equal access to justice. How many people are forced to, to compromise and do out of court settlements because they are poor and they can't afford access to justice? These are very, very serious questions I'm raising. Right. Um, uh, very important points. Uh, yes, vital points, really. Um, you, uh, your research, your works uh, on um, urban uh, issues. Uh, okay. okay. Would you like to mention I... some of them? Yes, uh, very much person I know you don't want to I talk don't about want to talk issues. about myself. Let me talk about the issues. Okay. The issues that that uh, uh, are um, minorities. <laughs> Write a lot about minority issues. And the constitutional lack of equality. The constitution, we have a very strange constitution because it started off in 1973 under a military, no, in 1973 under a democratically elected government of Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. But under the following military rule of General Ziaul Haq, the constitution was mutilated and distorted and abrogated and suspended. And he ruled by military ordinances, military ordinances. And the, unfortunately, Subsequent democratically elected governments after Ziaul Haq was taken away from us suddenly and violently in August of 1988, after 11 years of brutal repressive military rule. We have had, just by the way, we have had 34 years out of our 74 years of our existence has been under brutal military rule. Four military dictators, General Ayub Khan, General Yahya Khan, General Ziaul Haq, and General Parvez Musharraf. So under General Ziaul Haq, the constitution was really badly mutilated and distorted. And he brought in laws which are still not been removed by subsequent successive democratically elected uh, dispensations. This is a, a subject which we can probably uh, park and flag for another day and come back to because it requires a full session on, on our constitution and how, how, what needs to be done with the constitution. But to go back to minorities, where I started off uh, talking about the constitution, there are principles of policy and human rights clauses and articles in our constitution which are excellent. They remind me of the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations. It is so good. In fact, it goes even further than that because those were made in 1948 and, and this was made in 1973. So we have gone further. We talk about gender equality, uh, racial equality, ethnic equality, uh, religious equality. All this is enshrined in our constitution since 1973, but it, it is no longer a fact de facto. It has the de jure good parts of our constitution have de facto been removed by military dictators and no democratic dispensation has had the courage or the bravery or the guts to rid us of those accretions in our constitution which would make it a truly equal country, uh, equality in every sphere of life, including income equality, access to justice equality, poverty, getting rid of poverty, uh, equality of opportunity, equality of employment, equality of education. It would get rid of all the problems we have in the education sector, and I've written and published a lot on this. Um, uh, I'd like to share some of those, those, those writings with you because education, I think, is the primary pillar. If we cannot teach our younger generation 
uh, how to respect everyone, how to include everyone, how to accept differences, how to accept diversity, how to embrace pluralism, how to love the planet, how to take care of the environment, how to try to mitigate and adapt to climate change, how to stop climate change, how to reverse uh, global warming and, and you know, the increase in temperatures around the world. Unless we can teach our children this, which we are not doing at present, we are not teaching them to love my minorities, whether religious minorities, ethnic minorities, gender minorities, all kinds of minorities. We are not teaching that in the curriculum and textbooks. And this is something which is very close to my heart. And I have written and published a lot on this issue. Thank you so much. And um, I want to say minorities of the world unite because you constitute Absolutely. the majority. <laughs> you have nothing to lose but your chains. Yeah. Nothing yes. to lose but your minority status. Yes. yes. Uh, um, children. Children. Yes. Unfortunately, you, you unfortunately Pakistani children are suffering a lot. Pakistani children are being kidnapped, killed, child pornography, child labor, child employment, child illiteracy. There are 23 million Pakistani children out of school right now. 23 million. I can't wrap my head around. I don't even know how many zeros there are in 23 million children are out of school. And what are they doing? They're either, they're either in child labor or they are getting into drugs or they're getting into crime. Or, and please note this, please note this. I want to repeat this again and again if, if you have time or they are going into terrorism, extremism, militancy, and violence. This is shocking. How can any nation, how can any state, how can any government, how can any establishment not see this, not connect the dots and see the nexus between illiteracy, being out of school, despite the constitution, Article 25A says that there shall be compulsory and free education for every child in the state. This is a social contract that the citizens have with the state of, of, of Pakistan. And this and the, what is the social contract? Our constitution is our social contract. And it says very clearly, that every child shall be provided free and compulsory and universal education, primary and secondary education, free by the state. It's not happening. I see. So they're either in labor or they're, they're turning to extremism uh, uh, and violence and terrorism, terrorism. Yes, and um, listening to you is to me really like uh, listening to the conscience of humanity uh, in a way and um, um, earth civilization um, uh, network um, is a small at present number of people uh, like yourself and um, there is no official organization there is no hierarchy i consider myself an earth civilization volunteer and whoever win wishes may consider herself themselves himself whatever uh, an earth civilization volunteer and trying to do uh, a little bit better uh, that's all very humbly um, uh, i am honored uh, may i say something sure I am honored that you uh, consider me worthy of joining you as a volunteer, as a pro bono volunteer. 
in this mission that you have started, in this global mission that you have started. And I feel truly privileged and truly honored to join you as a volunteer. And we I feel together. humbled. Thank you. The same here. And um, uh, um, I'll, um, uh, instead of a full stop or a period, let's say, let's put a comma here. Uh, because of technical reasons. Um, and um, I enjoy saying we are together uh, to friends instead of by or whatever. We are together. Absolutely. We are together. Absolutely. We are Absolutely. together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Together. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay you, safe, please. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.